I don't really, I'm not sure I want the portal to go away or the NIL to go away, but they countered that a lot of kids are being approached by a lot of agents, and one of them talked about a high-profile transfer. Is that actually happening? Is NIL causing kids to enter the portal, in your opinion, to a significant degree, and is that bad for the game? Uh, there's no question that's happening. Uh, you saw uh, the best receiver in America, Lee Pitt, went to uh, USC, and I have some friends at USC that were aware of, of it certainly was that, that they were you know, listening to what's available to them. And I guess in a, capital, in a capitalistic society, that's more power to them. That if you can, you know, it's no different than a, a college coach or a, or a, a talk show host. You have a chance to uh, better your family. You know, that's your business. You know, but is it good for the game of football? I'm going to just share a quick story with you that I was a graduate assistant in 1986 at Ohio State. And Woody Hayes was still alive. Earl Hayes was the coach. I'm 21 years old, and he walked in and talked about the culture of Ohio State. Number one is a premium placed on education. He threatened every one of our jobs if our players didn't graduate. Number two was toughness, Hugh, and that was the toughest team always wins. And number three was team first, selflessness. And you sit here and look, here we are in 2022, and a lot of the recruiting is now based upon what's the best offer. You know, it's not about education. Unfortunately, I think I think there's still a lot of about, about education, but the stories I'm hearing from, excuse me, colleagues, is that uh, a lot of this is based upon the highest bidder. So, Coach, uh, keep in mind now, we're going to talk directly to students and parents, and you're Urban Meyer, and you've got three rings, and you know what you're doing when it comes to college football, and you know how to recruit. What's your advice to the student and to the parents or their guardian about agents, about this whole process? What should they be thinking and, and listening to when, when come around the agents and come around the coaches? I come from a family that's based on education. Uh, my sister, my father, you know, we're very, it, it's always been, I remember I got a C one time in English for the sophomore year and it was a bad day after that. So education has always been a premium. So uh, I think if things are available, that's above board and you can sell your jersey, you can do some, uh, uh, what's that, social media and get some money for it. I think that's all good, but I would put that below education. You know, education is going to follow you for the next 40 years of your life. 10,000, 15, 20,000, and even 800,000. That goes away rather quickly. So I just, you know, and I, I've actually talked to some families about this. Where I got some phone calls from previous friends or even people that are currently involved, and they just say, what should we look for? And I said, number one is make sure you're, you're picking a school because that school and that education is going to follow you. That 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000 is not going to follow you very far. So... That's my advice. I think, how do you solve a problem? Get a great education, make great networks, and so you set yourself up for life after school. Now, there are 50 different states with 50 different sets of rules right now. Do you think this is some place where Congress ought to get involved? Because the NC2A says, follow the rules of your state. I went to the big agency, NCSA, and they say they've helped a quarter million student athletes. I don't know, but that's true. And they run down the factors you ought to do when you pick an agent, et cetera. It's a, it's a jungle of rules and regulations. Would you welcome Congress actually getting involved in this, Coach Meyer? You know, I got uh, mixed emotions about that. I kind of watch from afar at Congress some of the things that are going on, you know, in our politics and in our, in our Congress right now, and I, I scratch my head. So I'm not sure Congress is the answer. Um, you know, I, I, I wonder someday if the – you know, when you hear the word student athlete right now, is it really student athlete or is it a semi-professional league where you're going to get paid for it? So I'm wondering somewhere down the road, and I've heard chatter that maybe some of the big schools separate from the NCAA and have regulation and, you know, they become unionized and they become revenue share from television because there's a lot of there's a lot of money out there, Hugh. I mean, more money. When I first got into coaching, we were in survival mode. And I'm not complaining because we, you know, coaches benefit more than anyone. Now players are. So uh, the current model, I, I think, is flawed. I'm not sure Congress is the answer, but there has to be some kind of structure from the top. And I'm not, you know, we just have hired a new president in the NCAA because right now I'm, I'm understanding there's not much, you know, there's regulation, not much regulation and not much enforcement of rules right now. 
Charlie Baker, the governor of Massachusetts, who's just become the new NCAA leader or designate, he's a very smart guy, and it's a big problem set, and I hope he talks to you about it. But kids have to make up their mind right now, and, and athletic directors have to. I'm sure you saw Coach Prime going to the University of Colorado. And I'm sure that he flipped a couple of people into the portal because he's Coach Prime, and there might be this halo effect. First of all, am I right about that, that college coaches who have this Coach Prime kind of halo are going to have an advantage in the portal? Do you think that's true, Coach Meyer? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, I know uh, Elon very well. Uh, I've known him for many, many years. I'm impressed with what he's done. I'm impressed with the discipline on his team. I like what he says. He talks about education. He talks about living right. He talks about doing the right things. So I'm very impressed. Every athlete in America, if Prime calls you, you're going to take that phone call. So there will be a ripple effect. And I think every coach gets that honeymoon effect. You know, momentum is so valuable. You've seen a couple of coaches last year get hired, and they were a big storyline, you know, in Lincoln Riley, and, and they benefit. There are other coaches got hired, and the honeymoon's over quickly. So Coach Prime is certainly going to enjoy the uh, ripple of his name, of the success he's had, uh, the way he talks, the way he communicates with players. I think you're going to see Colorado. The University of Colorado is going to experience something they have not experienced since the Bill McCartney area, and that's going to be in the front page of every sports section for the next six months. So if you're an athletic director and you've got a vacancy, are you now going to put at the top of that yellow pad Find someone who brings the halo effect with them so that we can get to the portal right away and the NIL money makes sense for them, too. Is that now going to enter into coaching decisions? And if so, how does anyone ever get to go from Bowling Green to Utah like you did? It's going to be tough for an athletic director to go take a chance on a Mac coach, isn't it? Yeah, the world's changed so much. I do believe that's, I wouldn't say it's one, two, maybe it's certainly in the top five when you start saying I'm going to hire a coach. What kind of swagger and what type of appeal does he have on social media? How can he attract the portal? You know, I saw a stat. There's almost 3,000 people in the portal just in the last two weeks. 3,000. Wow. There's not 3,000 wow. scholarships available. And I've heard the story about the player that leaves a university with the grass is greener mentality, and all of a sudden that doesn't show up. The other unintended consequence is a lot of these high school seniors, I read a story the other day, that he's waiting on an offer, then the offer right now the schools are telling him, we can't offer you until we really search this portal because we need immediate help in certain positions. So once again, there's some good to, good about it. A player has a choice. I witnessed that myself when I was a coach. If a player wasn't playing for us and he had a chance to go to a lower level school and start, we were all for it, especially when he graduated. But the unintended consequences right now is if I don't start, I leave. And I'm not sure that's a good thing, Gene. No, I don't think it is. Coach, you just mentioned the big conferences. Colorado is now, it's a major uh, media market. I think it's natural for the Big Ten, the expanded Big Ten, as is Stanford and the two Oregon schools. Where do you see the, the Big Ten going to round out to 20 if they're going to become a super conference north? I think the Pac-12 is certainly um, where, where they're looking. You know, I don't know that for a fact, but I would imagine if 20 is the number that I kind of heard probably the two has, has as well. You know, I, it's almost like you see a Big Ten versus SEC in the future of college sports. You know, Fox, big new kickoff against ESPN. You know, it's kind of the way it's shaping up. Uh, to say that's going to happen, of course, I don't know. It's all speculation. But I think there's some very appealing schools out west now that you have UCLA and USC involved. The thing you start thinking about if you're an athletic director in one of the Big Ten schools, you know, if you're Penn State, Maryland, Rutgers, uh, Ohio State, Michigan State, that's a big travel now. You, you are, and I'm not talking about football because football takes charter jets. You know, the other sports where my daughters are college volleyball players, you're, you're missing a lot of school. That's a wear and tear on the student athlete. Once again, unintended consequences of a transition from two schools. Or if you get more Pac 12 schools, now you can maybe have a Big Ten East and a Big Ten West. It makes a little more sense. Well, I think Denver is a media market. Washington and Portland are media markets. And you're part of Fox Noon Big big uh, Kickoff, Big Noon Kickoff. You know they need those media markets, right? They've got to go out and expand to the West. And I think the SEC is going to run into that, that, uh, that your network now has the grip on the Pac-12 or what's left of it. Is that what you hear coming out of the, the gossip on the side of the show? I hear a little bit of that gossip, and it's hard to imagine, especially on our show, we have Reggie Bush and Matt Leiner. 
And you remember, you there's you know there is a day that the Pac-12 was as strong a football as it was in the country. You know, USC was dominant. You had Terry Donahue, UCLA. Arizona State was very strong with Coach Snyder there. You had Cal was very strong. Washington has won a national championship seven once in a while. So the Pac-12 was a very strong uh, uh, conference. And then Oregon came up with, uh, you know, the, the great teams and the uniforms. And shoot, we played Oregon for a national title in 2014. So I, it's hard to imagine that the Pac-12 can disappear. You know, it, it's just and, – and you take two – it's a little bit like the Big 12. You take Texas and Oklahoma. You take USC and UCLA. That's like taking Ohio State and the Wolverines out of the Big 10. That's like taking Alabama and uh, Georgia out of the SEC. You know, I'm just not sure the future of that co- those conferences when you start taking the big boys out. The, the landmark, the, 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 top, you know, the top draws out of those conferences, what's the future? So. I can I imagine behind the doors right now, Hugh, there are serious conversations. I know there's people in the Pac-12 that are trying to get to the Big Ten. I know that for a fact. And uh, it, it remains to be seen the decisions made. Here, here's the final thought on that. The issue is that the Big Ten schools, that TV money that really supplies all money for all sports at their universities, they don't want to start dipping it up more. So the more schools you add, the more – you divvy up the, the pot. So I understand that's a big fight amongst the uh, universities right now. Coach, I want to go back. Before we talk some pure football, I want to go back to the student athlete who's in high school or a, a youngster. You've dealt with these young men your whole life. And right now the world has exploded with social media. I, there isn't a day goes by I don't listen to Buckeye talk. I don't know if you listen to Doug Marie's and Nathan Barrett and, and Stephen Means. I listen to them every single time they put up a podcast. They're always aware that they're talking about 18, 19, and 20-year-olds. I respect them a lot for that. And they try not to add to their burden. What is your advice? Because the world has exploded. There are like a 1,000 podcasts on Ohio State alone, uh, and as many for every program. What is your advice to a kid about getting onto it and listening to it? Because I think it's a, it's a huge change in the world of young athletes. My advice, and I've used it, is JT Barrett, when my great quarterback, a three-time player of the year in a Big Ten conference, our captain, and, and he would show me every once in a while social media posts. And it was all, you know, once again, how do you, you know, this day and age, it's a nasty, it's, you know, I'm not a fan of it. You know, I don't watch social media. I don't read that stuff. To answer your question, I, you know, those are friends of mine, Doug West and Reese, and, and some of those guys, I got to know them very well during my time at Ohio State, but I don't read that. You know, it's, be, it's almost because the, the negativity is what sells. And if you're a coach or if you're a player and you start reading that, that's, you know, that, that's occupying time that can be spelled so much, you know, with so much more uh, advantage. You know, study your opponent more than stare at that phone. I used to see our player, you walk in the locker room nowadays, you, and 85 guys are staring at their phones. And they're not, you know, and that used to bother me. That, you know, I, I remember... A hot tub. You come walking in here, the players would be five guys in a hot tub, not one of them saying, you know, getting ready for practice, staring at their phone. And no, I'm not a fan of that. And I guess. You know, I, uh, if you give a chance, if you get a chance and listen to Buckeye talk, I think you'll find that your old friend Doug, they actually do what I want reporters to do, which is keep in mind their kids. They're young men, and it's horrible. I want to ask you, it's also, how many. How many places did you coach before you got the head coaching gig at Bowling Green? Because I got a nephew who's a head coach now, and he did seven different jobs before he got his head coaching job. What did Urban Meyer have to do? Ohio State as a graduate assistant, Illinois State University as a linebacker coach, quarterback coach. Uh, The third one was Colorado State. Fourth one was Notre Dame, where Lou Holtz hired me at Notre Dame. And then I got the call to go to Bowling Green and – 2001. So what is that? Four or five schools. So what do you say to the young assistant or the graduate assistant? Because the world is upside down. It's sort of like the Hamilton show. The world is upside down and they can no longer count on the ladder. I think the ladder is broken. Do you, what, what's your advice to the young coaching assistant now? Well, financially, I think the Mid-America conferences, a lot of these coaches are just bypassing. You know, it used to be I, I was making $50,000 a year at Notre Dame. And I got the phone call to go to Bowling Green as head coach for $100,000. And so you start thinking about your family. And, you know, back then that was a lot of money. And, 
is an opportunity to be a head coach. You don't get those all the time. So a lot of people went to the MAC conference. A lot of people I know, and I know very well, are bypassing the MAC conference because financially you take a pay cut from what they're paying coaches now in college, at the higher level of college. So uh, the recommendation is with the same recommendation, the same advice I got from Earl Bruce is whenever I would ask a job, you do the best job you possibly can, you're not going to get over there. There's no chance. You know, I never had an agent really. I, you know, I had a couple guys I worked with later on in my career, but, you know, I was always, and my father was the same way. If you work hard, people will notice you and focus on your job. Don't focus on promote self-promotion. Well, that is, boy, that is so counter the culture. Let's talk a little football, Coach. First of all, a Hugh Hewitt question. When I see you on the, uh, the big noon kickoff, you're usually wearing a ring. I want to know which one you're wearing. Is it the Ohio State ring? I change it up a little bit. You know, I, uh, we did the Utah game, so I wore a Utah ring. We, uh, you know, I, I, if it's an Ohio State game, I certainly, because the crowd loves it, I wear the, an Ohio State ring. But I got a bunch of Florida rings I've worn before. And I just change it up once in a while. After the Utah game over USC, Coach Winningham came out and said, you're welcome, Coach Day. What did Coach Meyer, who brought up both of those men, think about that? Because I thought it was maybe the best line of the year. That was one of the great uh, moments I told Kyle Whittingham in Columbus, Ohio, you won't have to pay for a meal for quite a while. You just got the Buckeyes in the college football playoff. But Ryan Day, it's interesting, Ryan Day and Kyle Whittingham, those are two of the best football coaches I've ever been around. Uh, Kyle Whittingham, is, he, he doesn't get the credit he deserves. I mean, he was my defense coordinator at Utah for two years. And, that's as good a football coach that's on in the country. So Luke Fickle, another one of your uh, younger assistants, has gone up to Wisconsin. What do you think that's going to do to our friends in Wisconsin's program? Well, did you see that uh, Luke is changing the style of play a little bit? He's hired a guy from uh, Longo, Coach Longo from North Carolina. That's kind of a run-and-shoot, spread-offense kind of guy in Wisconsin. Going back to the Barry Alvarez days, especially because of the weather, the – just the culture there with the big running backs, you know, running and the offense linemen and pounding down your throat. So there's going to be a chance. This is the first non-Wisconsin guy in a, in a little while uh, that's come in there. Now, Luke Fickle is also in that same category as Kyle Whittingham and Ryan Day. Excellent football coach. He knows what he's doing. He did things at Cincinnati that's never done be been done before. So I think he's going to – I think instantaneously they're going to be back to where Wisconsin can – you know, Wes, that's one of the top two, three teams in the Big Ten. So, Coach, now pure football. We're looking ahead at the four, and the Buckeyes are in there against Georgia. I want to hear what you think about that game. And I also want to know if you uh, would like to see the rematch. I know you want Ohio State to beat the Bulldogs, but do you want to see the rematch with the team up north, or would you rather that they get upset early? Well, I'm a, I'm a you know, fan, and I'm not a coach. If I'm a coach, I wouldn't want that. You know, because... <laughs> Jim Harbaugh, and you lose a little luster on your big win. Uh, if you're Ryan Day and you lose it, you're 0-2 in the same year against Ooh. a hated rival. You know, I can't know. I mean, as a fan, let's go. That'll be the most watched game maybe in the history of college football. Uh, but I think Ohio State has got a street fight coming on their hands. I think they match up fairly well. You know, LSU you threw for 500 yards on Georgia. And a lot of them was when the Georgia was way up on them. But, they're, you know, the run defense, I think it's going to be really hard for Ohio State to run the ball, especially with Trading on Henderson out. Um, and they've struggled a little bit in recent weeks running the ball. But I think Marvin Harrison Jr. is the best player in America. I think uh, they'll throw the ball on the Georgia team if they can protect. Because uh, deep, the defensive line of Georgia is very good. But I think this is a very good matchup. And Ohio State needs to worry about Georgia. I mean, they're not worried about that next week. They're worried about this week. You know, I wonder how someone like you watches what happens and reads the news because they're all your friends, right? They're all your colleagues. You've known them for years. You've got some great relationship. You've got other relationship. Is it, uh, do you have someone prep a news package for you or are you just like me wandering around the political world, bumping into people and dealing with it as it comes up? No, we actually have a researcher. He's, he, he's uh, Adam at uh, Fox. So he, uh, we're actually, Fox is not allowed to do the playoffs. I'm going to do it for Big Ten Network because ESPN owns the rights to it. But he's helping me with that as well. And, and I have a lot of colleagues that I'll call and I'll reach out and find some 
behind the scenes, but behind the scenes things about what's going on with the team. So I get a little insight that a lot of people don't get. So coach, I want to close by talking about a very big issue, which is young men. And you've been dealing with them for, when did you start as a graduate assistant at Ohio State? What year? Uh, 1986. Okay, so it's been a while. You've been dealing with young men. What is, what is the situation right now with young men and, that you deal with, you see, you talk to? How has it changed over those, um, I'm trying to do the math in my head and I can't, almost 40 years? Well, I think there's a lot of positives. Right now, the, you know, you see these ACT scores and, and a lot of these kids have so much advantage that we didn't have, you know, especially people you know, that come from good backgrounds. You're talking about they're studying, you know, academically are so well prepared to get in then unfortunately there's the other side of it there's so many ill prepared and they come from tough backgrounds and i don't think the gap's ever been as wide as it is as now and that's heartbreaking to me when i was a coach i'd see you know a player that just didn't he came from a bad high school he came from a bad background and that player walks on a campus and it's a street street fight to survive and you see someone else who came from a good background a good high school and that, that's what I see that it's never been that wide of a difference, at least in my last decade of coaching. Uh, the other positive is I think right now it's never been, the college football has never been more viewed. The opportunity to provide for your family has never been better. And is that good for college athletes? I think it's great. But I think the one thing I'm going to go back to where uh, we talked about a few minutes ago, the answer I've always believed, the answer to everything is education. The answer, you know, that was drilled in me when I was a young person. The one thing that you can never, you know, you can speed, eventually you'll get taken from you. you. It's called an ACL or it's called age. You know, your strength eventually will wear out on you. Making the NFL is very hard to do. The one thing that will never leave you is your education and networks that you make. That's why we worked so hard when I was coaching. Real life Wednesdays, all the things we did to make sure. So, uh, the, it's a great time to be a young person. It's also, it's challenging. Hugh, we didn't deal with social media. We didn't deal with people just ripping us apart constantly. And I feel for those guys because I've seen it firsthand. No, oh, it's it's pretty brutal in politics. It's more brutal on young people and on coaches, I think, than it is on politicians. People in media sign up for it. That's not what you signed up for. It's not what the kids signed up for. Three last questions. First of all, do you miss coaching? Do you think you'll go back to it ever? I, I miss winning. I miss the players. I miss, but no, I don't believe I'm going to go back. I think it's a great area, but uh, I, I'm a different chapter in my life and focuses on other things right now. So um, Now, we've seen, a, we've seen a little bit of a mini move. Ben Sass is going to go run the University of Florida, a great senator from Nebraska. We see Charlie Baker going to go run the NC2As. Do you think there might be a reverse move of uh, – we saw Tommy Tuberville go to the Senate. Would Urban Meyer ever get into politics? You know what I'm really into? I got three grandchildren and one on the way, Hugh. So I got uh, 38 years. I did uh, 6 a.m. till midnight, all focused. Never really took vacations. It was all about finding a way to win that next game. And uh, what? it's really enjoyable to watch uh, my son. Grandchildren are the uh, grandchildren are the only thing in the life that is not underrated. It's really wonderful, and and uh, I'm glad to hear that. Let me close by asking you, and I gave you this question. In the post-Woody and Bo era, who's on the college Mount Rushmore Hall of Fame for football coaches? Who do you put up there? And this is not Woody, Bo, and present company is excluded. You can't name yourself. Who are the four or five you put on that? Oh, my goodness. Uh, for sure, the, the recent one is Nick Saban. You know, his, his model of consistency has been phenomenal. Uh, I'm a big fellow Woody guy. I'm a, uh, the guys I've studied, let me think here for a second. You know, I think Bobby Bowden. I think, unfortunately, what happened with Joe Paterno, I, I knew Joe very well, but I, I just uh, I feel very strong about his success as a coach. I knew him as a person, and so I have some insight in that whole situation. So uh, those are all the names that I studied. Tom Osborne is certainly a man that I studied. I actually went, uh, drove six hours to watch him speak, and then I drove back. That's how much respect I have for Tom Osborne as a young coach. That was well before cell phones and iPads. So those are the Mount Rushmore. Wow. 
Coach Urban Meyer, Merry Christmas. Thank you for joining us. Very, very fascinating. And I hope kids listen to you on social media. They probably won't, but I hope they take your advice and turn the phones off. Thank you, Coach. Great to see you.